This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Go to our website at wdtatpodcast.com and click on support to learn how you can be part of this effort to learn how to have better conversations, increase compassion, and build bridges, not walls. You can make a one-time donation or become a patron for as little as $1 a month and receive patron-only benefits. Thanks to all of our patrons at any level for your support. We really couldn't do this without you. Now let's get into the interview. In this episode, I talk to Mark Van Steenwick about his subversive children's literature, how to talk to kids about hard things, squirrels preaching about capitalism, and how St. Nicholas would beat Santa Claus in a fight. This is a two-part episode, so stay tuned next week for part two. Now let's get into it. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about things we're not supposed to, learn how to have difficult conversations, and talk to people about what makes them different. This is the We Don't Talk About That with Lucas Land podcast where we do talk about that with me, Lucas Land. It's never the right place or time. It's imperceptible to the eye. It's never the right place or time. My guest today is Mark Van Steenwick. He's the executive director of the Center for Prophetic Imagination in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In 2004, Mark and his wife Amy founded the Mennonite Worker, where they still reside. Uh, the Mennonite Worker is an urban intentional community committed to Jesus' way of hospitality, simplicity, prayer, peacemaking, and resistance. He's the author of a bunch of books, uh, including A Wolf at the Gate, The Unkingdom of God, and That Holy Anarchist. Um, and he's contributed to several books, uh, Viral Hope, Banned Questions About Jesus. I don't need to list them all. He's been in uh, Sojourners Magazine, uh, G's Magazine, JesusRadicals.com. And on and on. I'll, I'll list a whole bunch more of your accolades uh, on in the show notes, too. I don't have to read them all. Uh, nah. But <laughs> you were the former co-cons- co-conspirator, is what I was going to call you, but also co-producer. I think those are both accurate. Of the Iconocast, um, and you, where you interviewed Cornell West, James Cone, Bill Ayers, yeah. Starhawk. Uh, I never know how to pronounce this correctly. Was it? Was it? I, was, was, it it's hard. Like, it's I actually Wazi practiced Atwin. it. Was he at to win? Was he at to yeah. win? Okay. Even that's probably not exactly right. There's some cadences yeah. and inflections within the Dakota language that are hard for either of us to really pull off. Right, so. exactly. And these days, you're usually on the other side of the virtual microphone as you are today with me. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. <laughs> Thanks. It's good to like sit in your virtual presence. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... You know, I've been wanting to have you on for a while, and there's a lot that we could talk about, and I don't want to get into all the other things we might talk about in future episodes, teaser Uh for everybody out there. But um, uh, today I wanted to talk to you. You've written a a children's book, um, Mm -hmm. A Wolf at the Gate, and you have an audiobook version of that coming out, and you're, you're also working on a new saga epic four book series um about this character hackberry and i'm super i'm so excited about that i backed it on kickstarter and i'm i'm already feel like i'm starting to imagine <laughs> what it's going to be like so i i love that kind of stuff um but that gives us a chance to talk about talking to kids about hard things and mm-hmm. you know we'll we'll kind of see where that goes but first tell me like when you were growing up what what were some of the things that you were not allowed to talk about, either like explicitly or implicitly, or like the things that adults you maybe noticed avoided talking to you about? <laughs> well, I mean, when I was really young, I started noticing like anything around sex or money would be awkward. And right. So those were, those were shame topics. I felt like my family early on with the questions that I had about spirituality, they were kind of cool because I wasn't asking complicated questions. I didn't even think about asking questions about politics, but as I got older, like hitting my teens, I found that questioning anything around spirituality or even more politics was even touchier. 
mm. was taboo. Mm-hmm. And so like, especially like, I don't think I was intentionally trying to be edgy, but I'd ask these really obvious questions that seemed to me about, about things like around poverty. I remember in, <laughs> I talk about this in my book on kingdom, I think, but, uh, in high school, we had a, a youth worker who showed up with a brand new Corvette. And Becker County, Minnesota is kind of, it's right right by White Earth Reservation, which is mm-hmm. not a Shinabe mm-hmm. reservation. So there's a lot of poverty. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was on the lower end of the economic scale. And I remember like getting confused and frustrated and telling the youth worker, like, I don't understand how you can have that with all this stuff going around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I was not a liberal. I was just some young Christian in my early, like early to mid teens, uh, asking an obvious question that to me flowed directly out of the gospels that I was told to read. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And because of that, and a couple other things, they did deliverance on me. Oh, wow. They saw that this was, I was afflicted by the spirit of poverty um, oh. and the spirit of rebellion. And so I actually uh-huh. had a three hour. I don't know mm. anybody listening who's done a good old fashioned charismatic slash Pentecostal deliverance session. You have to like, they, there's laying out of hands. You have to publicly confess that you masturbated to this uh-huh. other person in the youth group, like all this stuff. Wow. <laughs> just to kind of break this, the chains of oppression. Uh huh. And after that, I, you know, it worked for a little bit. <laughs> that's in, then, that's intense. Then, you know, as the saying says, if they, if you cast out, by, cast out the strong man, he'll come back with his seven wicked friends. And that's what actually what happened. Oh, wow. And because they didn't do a good enough job. <laughs> and I'm now uh, some sort of leftist anarcho communist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, a three hour. I'm just, I, it was literally it, the question that came to mind was like, who brings like the finger sandwiches? That's a long time for for, for like a, a deliverance. It seems like you, you need somebody to plan for snacks for that because that's that seems like a lot. I remember it because like <laughs> this is just my way. Like, but you know, youth group started at 6 30 or something. And I remember it being going really late when it was done and people were mm-hmm. upset because I'm kind of I'm stubborn. Yeah. Uh-huh. So so it took a while. And I remember feeling that and thinking, oh my, that just took forever. And I was depressed afterwards oh. and like didn't feel like anything good had happened. I just felt ashamed. Yeah. Uh, so it stuck with me, but there was no food during that time. I was, I was yeah. hungry. Well, I'm pretty sure no finger sandwiches for Mark. Yeah. Well, I mean, it really, yeah. Points out the, the idea that like, how old were you when that happened? I'm going to guess I was around 15 or 16. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But even from very early, I feel like we think of our kids as like we as parents, like, or as adults, even our, our job is to sort of mold and shape them. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is kind of our job, but it more like in a control, like we, we need to like, just the idea of rebellion feels to me a little bit foreign and maybe people listening are like like yeah you got to uh keep those kids from going off the rails um huh. but i i wonder what are the what are those things that we're i feel like there's some assumptions there about what parenting is what raising children is not not just as parents and families but even as a community you're talking about a church community too like how we're supposed to engage kids and what are like, we're assuming some things about what is good for them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting. Like I, I, I'm not a great parent. I don't think I'm horrible. Like I am really, <laughs> the days where I feel like I'm failing, I'm like, well, at least I was probably, I'm probably better than my parents. Like that's yeah. kind of really the only solace because my parents my mom is deceased. My dad is not going to listen to this. So I feel free just talking about him behind his back, I guess. Uh, I felt like I was left alone to do whatever I wanted, unless I transgressed a boundary that they thought was important. And then I get punished. And so to me, the way I experienced parenting was conformity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of latitude. Yeah. Like uh, my parents didn't have a ton of rules, but they were strong rules. Mm-hmm. And it almost always had to do with their definition of respect, which I, is not my definition of respect. Mm-hmm. So parenting my son, 
I feel that. I feel my parents' parenting style come out of me irrationally in mm-hmm. emotional ways when I yell at my son, even though my mind knows like, no, parenting is about discerning the way they should go mm-hmm. and helping them that and, and nurturing that. And then if they're getting into a dangerous area or something that is toxic, uh, helping alert them to that, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. different. Like that's to me a positive mode of parenting than rather than the negative mode of parenting that I experienced. And man, I just kind of like, not, I'm a spiritual director. So part of the shtick is like helping people discern things. And I'm mm-hmm, realizing, you mm-hmm. know what? I, I, my son's 12, so it's not too late yet. I need to really be a spiritual director for my son more than anything else, helping him yeah. discern what is giving him life and what is not, mm-hmm. and helping them understand what, what are some of the things that make him unique and how he can really embrace those things and celebrate them. Yeah. But that never, that <laughs> never happened for me. I had to fight for any of that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for myself. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things I think that is the a major assumption that we make is we, we don't, this is very unconscious. I don't want to, people don't, you know, when you say this, people are like, no, I don't think that way. But like, we yeah. think of kids as not, full human beings right especially i mean when they're little babies of course they're like completely dependent on you and they can't say anything they have no they're opinions nubby little squirmy they're things. just they're yeah. i mean they might as well be a pet for a while right i mean <laughs> yeah they're kind of a gross very pet. fragile like yeah. these puppies come out and they can move around on their own yeah right right <laughs> pets actually have yeah. way more independence than um than our children when when they're first born right but mm-hmm. um And so I think it's hard for us and we don't make a transition to as they're growing and developing like personality and will. And we we don't see them as full human beings until so late in life that we've like missed a whole window of like their existence. And so one of the things I think um, is helpful uh, about how we engage our kids is seeing them as full human beings like like anybody else and how would you treat anybody else um and and they they get to have some some say and some like uh, opinions about things and it's you know the the like do it because i told you so kind of way of parenting like it really just doesn't work i mean i'll recommend a great book um called unconditional parenting by alfie Cohn that really breaks down the research on how it doesn't work. Like you think it works, but in the end you don't get what you want as a parent. So, um, yeah, I, I love the way that you are engaging through, you know, kids literature, um, a lot of like hard topics or things that I think are, are tricky to talk to kids about. So I'm kind of curious for, in your experience, how, how have you talked to, to your kid about, hard things like you know injustice in the world racism violence like some of those things that that we tend to try and like shelter our kids from traditionally anyways well i just don't shelter him from much you know like that's like i'm not gonna let someone injure him right but like i remember when uh the early days of black lives matter when jonas was still pretty little We'd take him to stuff and explain to him what had happened. And, you know, I'm not entirely sure that that's a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. But to me, it's like you you damn well know that like <laughs> the kid, like black children know that stuff because they have to. And so like, I'm not going to like somehow tr- treat my son that he doesn't have to know that stuff mm-hmm. because, you know, he's benefiting from it. Yeah. So we take him to things and I, you know, like I remember one time we took him to, this gathering is right after, you know, early on in Black Lives Matter, and there's a local nonprofit that had a community meeting to plan an interstate shutdown. And we went there, and, and, you know, there's several hundred people there in the planning meeting, so it was packed. And the kids were, like, put off into a side room, and there weren't many kids there. And so when we went to pick up Jonas, uh, they had done some drawing, and all the kids, including, including the black kids, drew, like, nice things. But my son drew a picture of a police officer shooting, like, Mike Brown. Right. Wow. Yeah. And so, and I'm like, oh, he's just drawing what he's heard. 
And I'm like, is this good or not? I'm like, no, I, I'm going to decide it's good mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I help him process that stuff. Like he knows uh, the way the world works. Like I think when we say shel- when we shelter kids, what we're doing is trying to tell them the way the world works in a fraudulent way. Mm. We're telling them a way mm. the world doesn't work. And then all of a sudden, when they're like in their teens, they encounter the real world and they're like not equipped for it. Yeah. Yeah. Or they're equipped for white middle class world, which mm-hmm. is not the real world. Yeah. And so for me, it's been exposing him to realities, talking about it as much as he can process it, um, but protecting him from harm, mm-hmm. um, not letting him see things that are going to be traumatic. And, you know, and that is a blurry line. I think some people would say telling someone like, oh, uh, Jamar Clark or, you know, you know, any you know, these different people that were shot by the police might be. A, I don't think so. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think that's intrinsically traumatic because, you know, it, it's funny to me that the people who would be most uptight about that are the ones that are buying a plethora of fake guns mm-hmm. uh, for their kids so they can go pretend to shoot each other. It's like, OK, well, yeah. Why is pretend murder okay, but dealing with the reality of real murder, something that's taboo? Mm -hmm. That's not because of people's developmental sensibilities. It's because they have white shame and they don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of how I've approached things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really, really helpful, Um, especially, you know, the part about um, we're, we're both white dudes. So, yeah, like... Uh, your kid growing up being sheltered is preparing them for a world uh, in which they continue to kind of perpetuate those privileges that you're providing for them, right? And so then then they're just going to grow up and be like, well, why doesn't the world work this way? Because this is the way I was raised that the world should work and the world doesn't work that way. And so now I'm mad. And, you know, one possible reaction to that is to just continue to perpetuate racism because it it's going they're going to they're going to say well it should work the way i was told it what it should work when i was a kid and it's not working that way and that's you know now i'm going to blame other people because that's also kind of what i've absorbed from the culture right and mm-hmm. I, I think that's really yeah really helpful but i think it's it it's scary for parents to to be willing to engage kids on these with these kind of issues, like you're saying, like not shelter them. Um, I, I was I, I have an example. Like I was thinking about this the other day because I was I was just watching a show. I don't even remember what show it was, but I was really struck by you know everything has the little ratings on it, mm-hmm. and and then it gives you the reasons why it has the ratings on it and everything. And I just started to think like, what are those really for? Why do we have those? And it's exactly what we're talking about. Like we we think that we have to shelter kids. That's what those are for. I don't know what else they're for. I mean, I guess kind of knowing what's in it, but but there's an age attached to all of those ratings. It's clearly for like you you have to keep your kids from being exposed to certain things. And <sighs> I feel like it's a it's like a shortcut for parents to not have to engage um, with their kids about hard things. Um, but and that all reflects a certain set of values. It's you know, so it's interesting. Like, I you know, I, I don't think it's okay appropriate necessarily to show a five year old a, a scene that has love making in it. But mm-hmm. like, that's usually it's sex is usually or someone being experiencing violence that's bloody is usually the two areas but then we'll be like hyper fixated on that but then we'll have have them watch thomas the train engine which literally the moral of thomas the train engine is that if you're not useful you will be sent to the scrapyard with the diesels (laughs) who are basically the black trains right or babar which is about like this elephant who went to france to get education and came back to africa to colonize the african uh, animals or or like all you know all these sorts of things there's like just toxic but like you know it's cute and so no big deal but you better not show a booby yeah yeah the things that we choose that we choose (laughs) that we choose to worry about are as long as it's like kind of animated like you're saying it's cute we're we're not going to worry about it but those other things we have to worry worry a lot about 
Um, and one of the things that I think is, um, uh, like I was saying, like it's a shortcut to not have to like engage with your kids. Uh, mm-hmm. I think people worry about what you're saying. Like, of course, there are certain things we're not going to show our kids on purpose necessarily or expose them to and and don't want to um, traumatize them. But at the same time, I feel like our, our kids are very capable of telling us a lot of things if we're willing to listen to them and, and engage them um, and say like, I didn't like that show or I, I don't want to watch that. That show's not for me. Like my kids do that all the time, you know, like, ooh, I watched that and that was scary. But then they'll watch things that you would think would bother them and they don't and they're fine with them, you know. So why aren't we taking more cues from our kids about what's developmentally appropriate, you know, in what they're they're watching and consuming? Um, yeah, you know, I, I get you know, some flack sometimes because un- people who unschool, people tend to think that they're, they're lazy parents or like letting our, <laughs> letting our kids do whatever they want, but it's, like it's a lot fair parenting. Yeah. N- yeah. But it's way more work to actually, you know, if you're depending on those little ratings on the TV show to do your parenting for you, then that's way lazier than what I'm doing by knowing what my kids are watching and being interested and talking to them about it and, talking about things that come up and and things like that so um this we're we're talking during during the holiday season 2020 i wanted to um ask you also since we're talking about talking to kids about things like what what do you uh what do you talk to your kid about santa claus how do you guys do We've met, we've always told them like Santa, we told them the story of Santa Claus, why it's a fascinating story uh-huh. that people tell to encapsulate what they think our good values of generosity and giving and how it's been co-opted by people trying to sell stuff. And that the real St. Fr- uh, Santa Claus was a, a Turkish <laughs> uh, saint who rescued people from sex slavery by giving them gifts. And that Santa Claus is just a story we tell and there's no such thing. Like we just tell them the straight up truth. Yeah. Yeah. To the yeah. level they could hear it. And then we've also like, I mean, it's, we don't buy him gifts for Christmas. Mm-hmm. The thing we do is as a family, we buy other people gifts mm-hmm. and we receive gifts from other people. Yeah. But if he has a need or something he wants, we sort it out amongst ourselves during the rest of the year. Yeah, Christmas yeah. is not. So we just try to read. It's about him learning generosity. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I, I did a holiday episode and, and which I, I told one of the, you know, stories about St. Nicholas, um, dropping the the gold sacks of gold through the window or down the chimney or whatever mm-hmm. for the dowry for these these girls or whatever and what what I love when when my kids were really little like 2 and 3 and they started asking about the Santa Claus I I similarly was like I didn't I never told them Santa wasn't real what I did say was I said Santa Claus is real And his name is St. Nicholas. (laughs) And here's the story about who he was and what he did. And that's what Christmas is about, right? Because it's sort of the the actual story of St. Nicholas is much is kind of subversive, which is why I wanted to bring it up, because Mm -hmm. it it subverts the the Christmas narrative about, you know, receiving gifts and the consumerism and and all of that. So um, I just love the way that you can you can use the actual story to subvert what's going on, which is kind of, you know, what you're doing with, um, a wolf at the gate and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I imagine Hackberry, it doesn't exist yet. So I, I'm still, you know, waiting, but I, I expect it to be subversive. So what, tell us a little bit about writing children's books and in a way that's like subversive or, or radical children's literature. What does that even mean? (laughs) Well, you know, I, I think I wrote uh, Wolf at the Gate at a time when it was shortly after my book, The Unkingdom of God, which is now just called Unkingdom and it's published with a different publisher. Um, It wasn't connecting the way I expected it and hoped it would. Mm. And when I talked about stuff with people, I get people get frustrated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'm like, you know what? maybe adults are too far gone. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I've always been one of those people like who I just, I love, I absolutely love 
watching cartoons and reading books that are geared towards children because that's the most fanciful and imaginative stuff. So I never mm -hmm. outgrew that. And that's the stuff I do with my son. We watch anime all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I'm going to tell a story that would be interesting. And it was also during a time when my son was like wanting to do everything involving pirates and like knights. And I'm like, you know, I want to tell a story about um, working for peace and justice that isn't like the books that he is given at school about like these children books about the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is fascinating and a great exemplar, and I, I love knowing about him, but that's not exciting for some sort of like <laughs> seven-year-old to learn about. <laughs> right. So I'm like, well, I'm going to take a story that I know that's not really that told about St. Francis and the Wolf of Gubbio, and I, that's got a lot of excitement and even some violence in it, and I'm going to tell that story and then add to the story the way, however I see fit. Like, so the first half of the book is basically a retelling of the classic legend. The second half is just me making stuff up. And it's me trying to like elicit, subvert the expectation. So mm -hmm. in the story of the Wolf of Gubbio, the bandits are the bad guys. The townspeople are the good guys. I make the bandits like at least sympathetic, not necessarily good guys. And the mayor and the guards of the town kind of the bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, and I make the wolf the hero of the story. So I, I'm flipping all that and using it to tell a story about peace, compassion, sharing, living in reciprocity with the land, all sorts of things that uh, actually were counter to the reasons I think the original story was told. The original story hmm. is Francis goes to this town that's beset by this hungry wolf. Um, he, you know, they, they don't know what to do. He decides he's going to go talk to the wolf. The wolf comes out and he makes the sign of the cross and tells the wolf to stop murdering people. And the wolf repents and becomes a friend of the town at the end. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard for me not to understand that as one of those, one among many of these medieval tales about some feral beast that represents paganism being an assault to the Christian people, which is St. George mm -hmm. and the dragon kind of stories mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and then salvation for the town comes by Francis converting the evil element, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. kind of what the story is. Well, what if the evil element here, uh, like what if you look at it differently? So I start telling the story about the wolf acting out of a place justified in a way. Mm -hmm. And what if the bad things are like the way in which the forces within that town that caused poverty, that caused bandits like to exist and the wolf to go hungry were the mm -hmm. bad thing and how do you convert that mm -hmm. so i just started kind of like looking at things from different lens and telling that story mm -hmm. um but in a way that i think i think is fun and enjoyable i mean lots of kids like the story yeah um so, yeah 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 it points out the way that you know even a lot of those great old stories are dividing the world into two camps and um, you know, one thing that I've noticed in a lot of like movies and, and, you know, like, uh, TV shows, all the different media, we have this theme now over and over again. I mean, you think of star Wars mm -hmm. and I've, you've seen these memes maybe that are like, you're a big fan of star Wars, but you're really pro American imperialism. How <laughs> does that, how does that work? Like the empire is is the bad guy in star wars star wars the bad guy is socialism like that's probably what they think it's centralized uh, government uh, okay. it's like everybody can just they that's can be self-deceived yeah. and look at things all kinds of ways it's fascinating right. to me how people do this yeah but i feel like a lot more <laughs> a lot of um things are doing what you're talking about doing now where where try where we're subverting who mm -hmm. who's the good guy and who's the bad guy and we're asking a lot more questions yeah. in the stories that we're telling and so i appreciate that works not, yeah. not only politically but it's actually makes for better storytelling right because that nothing is i love reading stories where you think it's going to go in way and they twist it that's what makes good storytelling yeah and so it just so happens that if you're taking all these stories that have been used to reinforce uh imperial thinking or capitalism or misogyny or white supremacy, which are kind of baked into all kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you're subverting them. It not only makes for if you do it right. Like I, I don't like when people do like challenge these things in a preachy way, mm-hmm. as though people change their mind based upon direct information. That's not really what happens. <laughs> right. right. But, it, but like it creates this great opportunity to like subvert all those norms with a better story. Uh huh. What do you, you know, I'm thinking about my own kids and how, like, um, I mean, we talk about politics and they, you know, they're on their, you know, media and they're consuming different YouTube videos and things too. My kids are, my older two are, are like 14 and 12. So they're, Mm -hmm. you know, um, in, in the middle of all of that and they have their own sources they're getting. So they'll come to me and be like, oh, Trump this and Trump that. And, and, you know, they know that like, I'm, I'm not a fan, but I, I always kind of push back a little bit too. I I wonder how you deal with, because I I get that feeling of like, (laughs) and it's developmental, right? Like they're in this sort of black and white thinking stage, um, how do you deal with that? I mean, have you had that with, with your kid too coming and like, yeah, "Yeah, the world is this way and it's this way and this way. And this guy's the bad guy. We got to get him out of office. And, and this guy's the good guy and he's going to solve all of our problems. (laughs) He's 12. And so he's in the black and white thinking stage. And so the way, you know, someday he'll maybe listen to this, but he'll, (laughs) what he'll do is like, you know, the world would be better if someone murdered <laughs> Donald Trump. And I'm like, I get why you're saying that. Like, it's not because of violence, but in his mind, you just need to get rid of him. My my seven year old would say that, so yeah. I understand. And so he'll say things like that, or like about the cops. Yeah. Because what I'll talk about, like, I'm not a big fan of the cops. Like, you know, we've been protesting the cops, and so he'll say these statements, and and I'll tell him stories and remind him, and I don't know how much this sticks, like. And this is the, ultimately the point of a wolf at the gate is that there's a possibility for transformation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll tell him like, I don't want Donald Trump dead. I want him stripped of his power and wealth so that he has a chance to learn how to live in mm-hmm. a real way. Mm-hmm. I don't want, and I have a story about this with a cop. Like I don't want the cops to die or go away or even suffer or anything. Like I, I have no punitive. I just want them to do something other than being cops. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and it, which happens sometimes, like sometimes mm-hmm. cops, like I, I've known a couple of people who are like, I'm not going to do this anymore. I, I don't like what this is making me into. So I'm going to do something else. Mm-hmm. So that's always a possibility. And I think that's the, I mean, that's the, the gospel part of it. Mm-hmm. So I don't expect my son to an, understand the nature, the transformative nature of the gospel yet, um, the way I understand it. Right now he has a, a mind for justice that hasn't balance with them. And so I just try to bring that in and say, look, I agree with you. Trump is bad news, but he's not fundamentally evil across the board. Mm -hmm. That's what happens if you have someone who didn't grow up right and they're kind of messed up, giving them too much power. Anybody Mm -hmm. who has Mm -hmm. too much power, who's not able to handle it, will do bad things. I want him to not have any of that power or wealth anymore. So he has a chance to live a good life. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'll tell him that. And I think maybe it sticks. I'm hoping. Yeah. This is the end of part one of this two-part conversation. Please join us next week for part two of my conversation with Mark. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at WDTAT podcast. You can also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Hope Fellowship Mennonite Church for their generous support of the podcast. Also, many thanks to Neil Curran and Infielder for the use of their music. You can find more of their music online at infielder.bandcamp.com. Until next time, keep showing up and keep being brave. What are you gonna do?
a That's Not Gun Productions podcast.